2 Timothy. And, uh, and let's just bow in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much for uh, this day, uh, for an opportunity for us to gather together as the family of God, uh, to be able to pray and to worship, to be able to hear beautiful songs that were just sung, and the, the songs that mean so much to us about the birth of your son, Jesus Christ. And it also gives us a challenge that we are to go out and to share that good news, that Jesus Christ was born, and he was born to die on a cross and was buried and rose again so that we could have eternal life and that it's a free gift, one that can't be worked for. It just requires our faithfulness and our trust in that finished work of Christ. Father, I thank you for this opportunity to stand before this family of God, to stand in your pulpit and to be able to share from your word. It is a blessing, it truly is, and I'm humbled by the fact that, that there's just this opportunity, and I ask, Lord, that you would be honored and glorified by all that is said and done. And Father, I pray that your spirit would move amongst us. Help us to clear our minds and our ears and our eyes and our mouths and to be able to just concentrate on what you have for us in the word of God. Lord, we do pray for our pastor and his family, all of his family, and uh, that they will get better soon and that they will be back again uh, to continue to serve you and us through the word of God. And Father, I want to thank you again also for your son, Jesus Christ, and for the salvation we have and the hope that we have that is in him. Help us, Lord, as we look forward to this new year, that we really take time to reflect upon not resolutions, Lord, but on growth, spiritual growth. Uh, help us, Lord, to reflect upon your word and uh, what it says and the challenges that it brings to us and help us, Lord, to grow this year spiritually and help us, Lord, also to be bold, willing to share the gospel of grace of God. Again, Lord, may you be honored and glorified, and we thank you for all these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, it's 2023, and uh, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but I do know this, that God continues to walk before us. And, uh, you know, over the last several years, it has not been easy. And, uh, and I think we would all agree that our country has taken a deep dive. And, uh, you know, it could start, it, it started way back, but the pandemic was huge, was it not? I mean, we were out of our church. We closed our church. We, you know, that pandemic, you know, it hurt. It hurt. And when we came back, what a glorious time that was. And I remember that board meeting when Pastor challenged us. And he basically said, never again. Never again would we close our doors. And you know, and we made plans in case something would happen again when the school would be closed and we wouldn't be able to meet here. What were we gonna do? We started to make plans for that, where there would be individual times to gather together as a family of God. 
And I think of that pandemic, and it, it caused a lot of problems, not just for churches. But I do believe what took place during that time, I'm not going to get into a political discussion. I don't want to do that. What has taken place or what has taken place over the last several years is not just the fault of one person or one political party. This deep dive we have experienced as a country has impact, impacted everything. It's impacted where our country is heading. And what is that going to cause? I think it has impacted the American church in many ways. The Christian church today has fallen into what I believe a deep dive. The Christian church has fallen away from the truth that God has given us in his word. And that's not, I'm not just talking about religion churches, churches with religious things. I'm talking about fundamental churches. I'm talking even about grace churches who have lost their focus. One of the things Bernie Getsky always says to us as a board, keep the main thing the main thing. And it's true. It's true. It's, it's easy for a church to lose its focus whether it's music, whether it's, you know, when pastor said at that Christmas message, remember how many churches he said had closed their doors for that morning and did not worship? Now, I'm sure many of them may have had a Christmas Eve service, but that's not the same. I think we have to understand, I believe, churches have fallen from the truth and they have missed the mission which God has called us to do. He's called the body of Christ. And what is that body of Christ to do? The deep, the, the deep dive has destroyed our schools. Things that are going on in our schools today are just bad, just flat out bad. You know, first, second, and third graders, kindergartners, we can't call them boys and girls anymore. You cannot do that. Why? Because they have not yet learned what their identity is. That's what's being taught in our schools. Things like critical race theory. Things like equity. You know, a child now, can t a student now in junior high school, junior high school, can come to a teach teacher and say, I don't want to be called Bob anymore. I want to be called Sally. And if that's that child's request, that's what they call them. They don't go back into the records and change their records, but they will call them Sally. And if the parents disagree, too bad. It's the child's right. Really? 13 and 14-year-olds can make that decision? It's not only destroyed our churches. What about our homes and our families? You know... The result of this deep dive has been darkness. It's been sorrow and despair, bitterness and hate. Those things are amongst us everywhere. Hopelessness. And where does hopelessness lead, lead to? It leads to mental illness, suicide, mass killings. And where is the family? What, what has happened to the nuclear family today? Where's it gone? And, you know, the list can go on and on and on. But here's a question I want to ask of you today. 
How are we to respond as a believer in Christ? How are we to respond? What is the effect upon our walk with Christ? I ask you to turn to 2 Timothy. Look at chapter 3. And I want to read verses 1 through 7. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. And from such people turn away. For of this sort there are those that creep into the households and make captains of gullible women, loaded down with sins, led led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's what Timothy, or Paul was describing to Timothy, and he's warning him to be aware this is what's going to happen. Doesn't this just share about what we just talked about? This is everything in that. And you know, this is a clear illustration of where our society is heading and where it's at. And who knows where that's going to go. So what is the answer to this? How are we to live our lives in this present world? Pastor Paul, we all know, has those two very big, he calls them rules. I think they're beyond that now. (laughs) I think it's a a requirement. I think it's, if you don't do it, you're going to get spanked, you know. (laughs) Context, 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 and the littlest words mean the most. You know, we hear it all the time. Pastor Paul, if you're listening, don't worry. We're going to be good. <laughs> turn, turn back to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. And I want to read this. 5 through 1 through 4. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we also have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulations produce perseverance and perseverance, character, and character, hope. Now, hope does not disappoint because the lovers of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. That's Romans. I want want you to turn to 1 Peter, if you would, please. 1 Peter. And in 1 Peter chapter 1, I want to read just a couple verses, uh, starting with verse 7. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse, actually, oh, I did not want to do this. <laughs> 6. <laughs> Go to cha- verse 6. In this you greatly rejoice. Though now, for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the, genu- the, genu- the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, 
honor and glory in the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love, though now you do not see him. Yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. You know, you read those verses and you think about those, those two passages of Scripture, Romans chapter 5 and 1 Peter 1. You know, the key words in those, those passages are rejoice and joy. Rejoice and joy. And, and Paul says, joy is inexpressible. You can't, you can't explain it. You don't see joy. We don't understand it. It can't be described. And it doesn't make sense in which the world we are currently living. It doesn't make sense. All the things that are taking place around us. And we're supposed to be joyful. We're supposed to be rejoicing. That doesn't make sense. Now, who does it make sense to? And, and you know, one of the things I, I had known even prior to being saved, happiness, happiness is something that we can make, Right? We can make happiness. We do it all the time. And man today, women today, children today, we, we, we love ple pleasures. We love fun. We love excitement. So, you know, we can have all of this ha happiness. And generally, happiness is based on a moment. Back in November... I was excited. I was really happy. My daughter just had a baby. And she was beautiful. And it was so much fun and enjoyable to be able to hold her. We were happy. Um, you know, happiness can happen when a football team wins. I'm not going to go into that today. <laughs> I would just say Ohio State lost too. That made me feel a little better. <laughs> but, you know, we, we can make happiness. It's based on a moment. And then suddenly things happen and it's gone. Right? It's gone. But let me tell you something. Joy abides forever. There's always joy. And there is a difference between a Christian whose faith is in Christ and a non-believer. And this is a response, folks. This is a response. It should be. Be our joy. Non-believers should be able to look at us and see joy. It should be visible in our lives. It should be visible in our attitudes. It should be visible in the things in which we say. How easy is it to get into a conversation with a group of people and all you talk about is the negativity that's going on in the world. And you're involved in that. I've seen that happen in my own life. And then I walk away and I thought, I just blew it, Lord. Forgive me. I should have been talking about the joy which Christ brings. And we don't have to worry about all of those other things. I want to share some examples to you about the difference between happiness and the difference between joy. And I want to begin by turning to 1 Corinthians, if you would, please. 1 Corinthians 
chapter 10. First Corinthians chapter 10, and I'm going to be reading from verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all of our fathers were under the cloud. All passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the, in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food. All drank from the spiritual drink. They, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things, listen, now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Do not become idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Nor let us commit sexual immorality, as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 fell. Not let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed by the serpents. Nor complain, as some of them also complained, and, they, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now all these things happened to them as an examples that they were written for our admonition upon whom the end of the ages have come. Now turn back to Exodus chapter 14. Let's look at what Paul is actually sharing what the example is. Exodus chapter 14. <clears throat> There, just a second. Thank you. Here we go. All right, got there. Okay, Exodus chapter 14, verses 21 to 23. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. So the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea and on dry ground, and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued and went after them into the midst of sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. You know, you look at that, and then I want you to look at verses 26 and 28 of the same chapter. 26 and 28. And it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, that the waters may come back upon the Egyptians on their chariots and on their horsemen. As Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and when the morning appeared, the sea returned to its full depth while the Egyptians were fleeing into it. So the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. And then the waters returned and covered the chariots, the horsemen, and all the armies of Pharaoh, that came into the sea after them. Not so much as one of them remained. So here, here is a really good example of how God works, the power of God. And we can think about this. I mean, we understand this is some historical pieces from Israel and what was taking place in the Jews as they were coming out of Egypt, right? Right? And uh, But think about this. How often have we asked God to pro provide for us? 
And what are the examples that we have? I want to give you one, a real recent one. We have our own building in 18 more days. <laughs> and in 18 more days, we're going to close upon our own church. And I don't know about you, but when we got that, that agreement, I cried. I cried. And I could do nothing but just sit there and bow my head and praise God. Twelve years. I tell you, twelve years of going to building after building after building. Coming back as a board and discussing it. And there are always, there is always something wrong with the building. Oh, boy, I thought I killed the wire there for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> you know, excitement, excitement. But, you know, it's just amazing, that whole thing. And, you know, the one thing that, that got me the most, we are always praying that God would give us a church. And through that time, we looked at four different churches. Four different churches. Too big. You know, one of them was huge, over 400 feeding. You know, and then the other one, you know, we got a call and they wanted us to come and look at this building. We went and looked at the building. Part of the building was owned by the American Legion. And in the back was the stand set up for their fall beer time. The beer fest. And I'm thinking, I don't think this is going to work for us as a church. Nice building. Really nice building. But it didn't work. We went to Nina and saw a building. Kind of small, not bad. A lot of work. A lot of work. Just didn't work. You know, we saw another building in Oshkosh. Uh, a church building. And again, very little parking. Not much we can do with it that failed. But we kept praying that God would provide us a church. Not just a building, but a church. And look what he did. He gave us a building. You know, and since then, I, I, I tell the board this, and I've shared this with friends, my, my daughter and my sons who have been praying with us and all of that. And I said, you know, when the congregation came and they were walking through it, there was excitement. And then when we had our vote to purchase it, there was just excitement. And I haven't seen that kind of excitement in our congregation, our family, for such a long time. And uh, what a blessing that was. And here, you know, you start, you see what's going on here. And... Uh, I want you to look at, um, you know, it, as we've seen what, what uh, Israel did, uh, look at Ex Exodus 15, verse 1, and let's see how, Mo how the Israelites responded to God's power. Then Moses and the children of Israel sang this song to the Lord and spoke, saying it. And they spoke, saying, I will sing to the Lord. For he, I'm not going to read the whole song. I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed glory, gloriously. The horse and its rider has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song. He has become my salvation. He is my God. I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. You know, listen to, to the Jews. They're so excited about what took place. They're all, you know, they've seen the power of God at work. And when you recognize that, you know, what a wonderful thing. But now look at 15 verses 22 and 24. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur. And they went to went three days. <coughs> Excuse me. They went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Now, when they came to Myra, they could not drink. 
<coughs> the waters of Myra, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name it was called Myra, and the people complained against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? They're complaining. They're murmuring. Three days, just three days after their songs that they were singing, that they're going to exalt God. They saw the power of God. And now they're complaining. They're complaining again. And, you know, it, they just murmured against Moses. they just seen that power of God. And, and my question to, to you is, where did that joy go? Where did their joy go? And, you know, it's an amazing thing when we stop and we see this. Paul uses this event as an example for us. The Jews were under a cloud. They passed through the Red Sea. You know, that cloud was there to guide them as they were coming away from Egypt. They passed through the Red Sea. They were baptized into Moses and, at the same, and ate the same spiritual meat and drink and the same spiritual drink, but... Back in Corinthians, Paul says, God was not pleased with them. Why? Why wasn't God pleased with them? It's an amazing thing. They lusted after evil things. They became idolaters, fornicators. They tempted Christ. They murmured. They were destroyed by the destroyer. Destroyed by the destroyer. All of this, Paul says, is an example to us. Where is your joy? Where was your joy during that pandemic? Where was our joy in the last several years as we've seen this deep dive of this country? And I ask you, and I want you to reflect upon. I ask you to reflect upon what should our response be? And my question is, where is your joy? And I think there's another example here. You know, have, have you ever been frustrated, upset, <coughs> uh, mad, angry? <laughs> have, have you ever been shocked? Oh, Marie says just once. <laughs> what a godly man. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know, I just want to share a story with you. I became very upset. I was frustrated. I got mad. I even got angry. I yelled at somebody. I actually wanted to fire her. Uh, and I was shafted. <laughs> you know, Back when I was a, a, a director in, in, at Kakana in the administration, uh, Kakana went through uh, seven suicides in four years. And, uh, and, the big, and my, my role was working with pupil services. And, and in the city of Kakana, it was coming back on the school. Why? Why is the school allowing this to happen? Why is the school having this happen? We had, we had five students and two teachers who committed suicide. And they kept coming back at us. And finally, my superintendent came in my office and said, Randy, we need to talk because this isn't our problem. And I agreed with him. It's not our problem. Do, do we have a part in that? Absolutely we do as teachers and as an education. But, you know, he, he charged me with figuring it out. And uh, I just happened that week to get a letter from the government, and there was this grant that could be given. Um, and I talked to a grant writer, and she was going to help, help me write the grant, but then she said, you know, you 
have a better chance if you partner with some other schools. So we partnered with Little Shoot, and we partnered with Kimberly School District, and we wrote this grant, and we won it. A little over $400,000. And so that money was to become, because of in our letter, in our application and things, we talked about the suicides. We talked about uh, the mental illness that was taking place and those types of things in all three schools. Now, <coughs> Little Shoot at that time hadn't had a, a suicide, but they did a little bit later. And same with Kimberly. Uh, so what happened was, is um, because I initiated, I became the director of that grant, which is another issue. But anyway, one of the things we could do was hire an assistant director of the grant to help pull it through. So we hired this person and she was marvelous. I mean, she went out and one of the first things we did is formulated a committee. And the committee was a lot of people from Kakana. We had the police chief, we had the fire chief, we had the mayor, we had clergy, we had community members, all part of this committee with teachers and others. And we got to be able to talk to them about what was done. And we had an autopsy of suicides. Thank you, Brenda. So they had this autopsy of suicides and these people from New York came in and they interviewed all of the ones that were the parents, the friends, all of the people that were part, that knew the children and the teachers who were part of suicide. Only two of them the parents refused to do the autopsy. But when that came back, we found out that there was, excuse me, we found out that there was lots of um, opportunities for people to see, to see the warning signs. We found out that the clergy, the churches, weren't talking to the kids even though some of them had youth ministries. And we found out that the kids' friends who recognized who they talked to about, but yet did nothing. They did not talk to anybody about it. And so we found out where there was a lot of things that went on. Well, anyway, to make a long story short, that, that lady who was our assistant director had to leave. And so we hired this other person. And this is where I became... Jacked. We had this big committee. We were moving along. We were planning for an all-day mental illness day in all three schools. We had a lot of things going on, and we were moving. Gr I mean, we were seeing things change. We brought in speakers and people to help um, our students to recognize when they recognize something to speak out and to talk, and it was working wonderfully. Well, this person came in, and she, she is, I mean, she... She does a lot of wonderful things about suicide. She's actually a director of a program up in Kakana. And, uh, but she, she just, I would meet with her often. We'd talk and I'd say, we need to do this, this, and this. And are you okay with that? Yes. Do you need any help? No. And eventually the committee fell apart. The community co committee. And, uh, and then uh, she came in and, and I said, we're three weeks out from Little Shoot having their, their all day mental illness thing. Are we ready for that? Do you have all the speakers lined up? Well, I'm still working on that. And I said, we're three weeks out, you know, and uh, I met with her two days later. I said, in two days, I'd like you to, I want, want you to bring me a schedule so we can get it to Little Shoot so they can start to plan. Nothing. So I became shaft. And I got angry. And I yelled. I shouldn't have yelled, but I got I yelled. And uh, anyway, long story short, uh, I basically, she, she was being paid salary from the, the grant. I basically cut her salary, and I took on the, the role. And uh, she had to stay uh, because I didn't want to write that in a report to the government that this was all going on. So... She stayed and I gave her small duties to do so that she was able to do those. And uh, 
And in the long run, things turned out well. But, you know, I became Jack. And even though, you know, there were times when I, you know, when I went to work in the morning, I always prayed that God would just give me strength and guidance and help me to be the person I need to be in front of people. And, and that was one of the things that really, really bothered me. Uh, but, you know, we get those things happening, and sometimes we get that. And, and Moses was shat. He was upset. Look at 15, verse 25. Same, same thing. 15, verse 25. And listen to what Moses said. Uh, we'll go to 24. And the people complained against Moses, saying, what shall we drink? So he, Moses, being a little shaft, cries out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, and went and he told him to cast it into the waters, and the waters, and that tree made the water sweet. And uh, there he made a statue, and on the ordinance for them and there he tested them and said if you d diligently heed the voice of our of Lord your God and do what is right in his sight and give ear to his commandments and keep all the statutes I will put none of these diseases on you which I have brought to the Egyptians for I am the Lord who heals you so you know here here Paul turns this and, and he talks about how how that took place, and and now here, and what does what does that tree represent? The tree represents Christ. It represents the cross. And the apostle Paul says, when he gets angry, here's his response, his his frustration. I go to the cross. I go to Christ. Go to Romans chapter 5, and I want to read those, those verses again. I want us to understand. Romans chapter 5. <laughs> you know, it's interesting when you go to different churches to speak. There's no church that I've been to to speak where you get an hour. It's always 30 minutes, 45 minutes, and I'm going, what? You got to be, I never was on time. I just got to tell you that. But uh, um, we're close. We're close. We'll be down here soon. But in Romans chapter 5, verses 1 to 4 again, therefore having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. When we are struggling, we go to Christ, and then we have peace through our God, and then to go on. And it says, Though whom also we have access by faith into this grace, which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, that not only that, but we also glory in the tribulations, knowing that tribulations produces perseverance. Perseverance produces our character and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Now, when we think of through those things, we have peace with God and we have access to his grace, God's grace, and we rejoice in the hope. Therefore, now listen, listen, church, this is important. This is really important. And I, when we put our trust in Christ, we are immediately placed in Christ, right? Right? We are in Christ. There's no question about that. Now, I'm going to step on some toes here, and I want you to know I've stepped on my own a lot. Um, but if we are out of our joy, if we are discouraged, disappointed, frustrated, upset, angry, all of those things, and we're out of our joy, I believe we have lost our joy, and then we're out of of his, Christ's presence. So, again, what is our response? What is the response when you're, you're frustrated, you're angry, you, you feel like your joy is gone? What should we do? 
One, remove yourself from that situation. Wherever that is, whatever that is, remove yourself from that. And then go to the cross. Go to Christ. Why does Paul tell us in in Thessalonians, pray without ceasing? Constantly pray without ceasing. And he wants that to happen there for our own reason. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 16. I love this. I just love, I love reading the Psalms. And uh, Psalm 16. I'm going to get there in just a second. Psalm 16, verses 8 through 11. It says, Have you shiveled up, up, me up, and is it the witness against me? Am I reading the right word? Psalm 16. Oh, I turned back too far. I'm sorry. This is a new Bible. Well, it's not new. But it's one that I I read and I don't study in it, so I don't have a lot of markings in this. But, uh, um, all right, I got it. Psalm 16, verses 8 through 11. And it says, I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in shoal, nor will you allow your Holy One to seek corruption. You will show me the path of life in your presence is fullness of joy, and at your right hand are the pleasures forever and ever. You know, that's, that's where God wants us to be. If you have a bitter spot like, like Israel did, and you're murmuring, you're angry, where is your presence? It's in yourself or it's in your world, the world. It's not in Christ. And that's where we need to go. We need to go to the tree when that joy is missing. And, you know, and I think about what's taking place this year, 2023. You know, what's going to take place and what are we going to be able to do? Turn quickly to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. And, uh, you know, Paul here, we know that Philippians is off, often called the book of joy. Um, but Philippians chapter 1, verses 13 to 20, I would like to just read these, these presents, um, these pieces. Uh, let's just start at 12. But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel, so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. All right? He's gone to Christ. He's, he's in a place, I mean, he could be upset, mad, given up, but he's gone to Christ. And he says, my chains are in Christ. And most of the brethren of the Lord, having become confident of my chains, by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Now he says, some indeed preach Christ, even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my chains. But the latter, out of love, knowing that I am appointed, knowing that I'm appointed for the defense of the gospel. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And in this I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice. You know, Paul's caught, caught there. He sees what's good, what's happening, and why he's in prison there, why he's in chains. And he sees the gospel is going out. But there is this group of people who are doing it but they're doing it out of selfish ambition. Paul says, I'm going to rejoice because the gospel is going out. Yea, I'm going to rejoice. Now, 
He's saying that and rejoice. But could Paul have been just shafted by that whole thing? You bet he could have. But again, he goes to Christ and he sees what Christ is doing. I think those things are, are just really, really important for us. Now, the one thing that I think is really, really important that we see, and that is, is and I think we all understand this, as we go back to Ephesians chapter 6, we're not going to do that because we know what, what it says there about the armor of God. When we put on the salvation, uh, the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, what are we talking about? We're talking about our minds. And then if you go into Timothy, what does Timothy say? You know, Timothy tells us to study and not be ashamed. Study the word of God. Mind, our mind. Put the word of God in our minds. That's our answers, brothers and sisters. That's our answers. We want to have joy. This year should be a year of joy for Grace Bible Church Oshkosh. It's going to be a year of joy. We're going to have, you know, our pastor, you know, how can you not be excited for him? Of course, I'm going to miss him dearly. I've worked with him personally for 18 years on the boards. I love Pastor Paul. I love Rebecca. I love their family, and I love their ministry in which they've done. But you can't help but rejoice for what he's going to be doing. He's going to be going to several churches doing what he did here. And look what he's done. We have grown in our salvation. We have grown in our walk. And what a blessing that we'll see to have him going out to other churches and doing that same thing. And I will tell you this. I firmly believe that God has a man for Grace Bible Church. We will have a pastor. I'm not going to tell you that it's going to happen in one, two, three, four, even six or seven months. We don't know that. <coughs> I'm praying it doesn't take 12 years. <laughs> it's not going to. It's not going to. Oh, that was bad. Anyway, I shouldn't have said that. But anyway, you know, it's interesting. Paul didn't allow Satan to get into his mind. He took on that helmet of salvation with the sword of the spirit, the word of God. And we need to be in the word of God. We need to study it. We need to memorize it. We need to reflect upon it. When, and you will, fall into a bitter spot. Don't get angry. Don't get frustrated. Don't get discouraged. Don't get depressed. Go to the truth. Go to Christ. And let's see what Christ will do. Joy in the, in the word of God, in the Greek, talks about peace that surpasses everything. That's what joy is. It surpasses everything. You know, in, in turning, in turn to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. And I just want to close and re, uh, read these verses to you. 12 through 18. It says, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, <coughs> but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Do all things without complaining and disputing that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, and that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Yes, and if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you. For the same reason, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. You know, it's, it's, that's who Paul was. And it's all about people and it's all about him. And, uh, and again, I want to say there's, there's things that are going to take place. 
And it's not about being exhilarated over something that's great or happiness or those type things, the excitement of winning a prize. Paul was not talking about temporal things. He's talking about living in joy is a state of being in the right relationship with Jesus our Lord, with our other brothers and sisters. You know, that's where our joy needs to be, ourselves living in joy in Christ. And we don't just survive. This is key. We don't just survive. We come alive, and then we thrive. Our walk will thrive as we live in joy. Joy doesn't come when you try to hold, hold it all together. Joy comes when you let God hold you. And that's where it is at. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity again. What a blessing it is to be able to share your word. And I thank you for my brothers and sisters here. I thank you for their lives and for their faithfulness and their trust that they have placed in you. Help us all, Lord. It's, it's hard. It's difficult. We live in a, just a terrible world, and it's getting worse. Help us, Lord, not to concentrate on those things, but to concentrate on Christ, upon your word of God. Help us to take time to read it, to study it, to memorize it, and just to reflect upon it. Help us to make it our guide, our walk each and every day. Lord, I thank you again for your son, Jesus Christ. I thank you again for this opportunity. And I ask, Lord, that you were honored and glorified by all that was said and done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to thank you all for joining us. We appreciate you and consider you a part of our family, just as the people attending in person. We want to ask that if this message touched you in any way, that you like this video, share it with your friends and family, and then also subscribe. This way you will get notified when we come out with other videos that may help bless you and others. Thank you again for joining us, and until next time, God bless and keep looking up.